silver has regathered itself and has plenty of energy. I think to think next stop is probably it'll it'll maybe pause a little bit in the mid to high thirties, but I think next stop is probably mid forties. And then ultimately I raised my target target in my July letter to seventy five. Today, we have a special guest, David Hunter. He's the chief macro strategist at Contrarian Macro Advisors. He's known for his bold predictions about the economy, the stock market, and what's of most interest to us, the silver and gold price as well. A few words that I use to describe David is he's experienced, he's credentialed, he's courageous, and most important, he has a knack for making accurate predictions David, welcome to Ron's Basement. Uh, thanks, Ron. Glad to be on. The other thing you forgot to mention is we both went to DePaul. So that's right. <laughs> I got we my both... MBA there, so that's <laughs> we... not so bad either. That's right. That's right. We're both uh, DePaul University graduates out of Chicago, Illinois. So as, as you see what's happening lately, David, in the gold and silver market, it seems like uh, gold and silver are making... Uh, a rather strong move to the upside. Now, I want to mention to our audience that the last time you were on was May, about five months ago, May of 2024. And at that point, uh, I went back and watched our previous interview. You'd predicted $35 or $36 silver in the near term. And you talked about the possibility of moving up towards $3,000 gold here in what you call kind of the, the pre-bust, I guess, like melt-up phase. What's your assessment on what's going on uh, right now? Yeah, so I think we are in that move. Um, we got up to maybe 33 last summer and then backed off for a couple months. And um, we've uh, silver has regathered itself and has plenty of energy. I think to think next stop is probably it'll it'll maybe pause a little bit in the mid to high 30s, but I think next stop is probably mid 40s. And then ultimately, I raised my target target in my July letter to 75. So I had had a 60 dollar target what I call pre-bust target. Mm -hmm. um, and I raised 75 in July. I raised my gold target of 3000 to 3400 about a month ago. So I think they're both in gear. I think they have, you know, uh, particularly silver has been a very frustrating trade for people. Um, you know, I had its uh, big run in the first decade of this century and, you know, in 2011 topped out and it's been a a long slog since uh, some good years, but really a, a long period where people were disappointed. We are in, I think it's all systems go now for the precious metals. Um, and I, I'd expect both those targets, you know, the 3,400 for gold, 75 for silver, uh, I think very possibly could reach those in the first quarter. Wow. So wow. those are big runs. I mean, um, yeah, you got to get above the old highs on silver, which was 48, I think, back in 2011. So, you know, it's not going to go straight to 75 without a blink. But I think, you know, I think in the next six months, you've got, you know, less than probably six months, you've got uh, a big run coming in the metals. Wow, that's good news. You're, you're, uh, you're becoming more and more popular with the uh, Ron's Basement community as you, as you talk about those numbers. Do you feel like silver in particular... I mean, a lot of people look at the gold. Do you look at the gold to silver ratio that right now, I think that's around 80 to one. Um, do you factor that in when you're looking at these price targets at all? Yeah, let me put it this way. I'm aware of it. It doesn't really factor a lot into my forecast. Other than the reality is that in, in precious metal bull markets, silver tends to outperform almost every time. And in bear markets, you know, when they're correcting, silver tends to get hit harder. So it's a more volatile metal. You know, it's more cyclical. Um, I do think the you know the gold to silver ratio was up near ninety, I think, and is down to eighty, as you say. I do think that could get down towards forty uh, in this move. So, you know, if you get thirty four hundred divided by seventy five, I'm not sure what you come up with, but that's that's kind of what I'd say is where we're headed. So yeah. silver, silver definitely is probably the the um, more aggressive upside move here. Mm -hmm. And I think that's pretty common. Yeah, yeah. Do you when when you look at gold and silver, I hear some people say that they are some of the most forward-looking markets in the world, right? They're the, some of the older markets, and they they can see out into the future a little further than some of the other markets can. 
Do you think they're flashing um, because of this, of the price run? Could that be a signal that we could be in for some hard times uh, after we go through this kind of melt up phase? Or yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I hear people talking about it in relation to obviously the geopolitics out there with Israel and, and Iran and with Ukraine and Russia. Um, you hear talk about it could be signaling something, you know, um, uh, problematic in terms of the election. I really don't know other than to say technically you know, this was all set up. I saw all this stuff coming. It was just a matter of time. So I, I have a hard time really trying to tie it to any specific um, predicting of, you know, some some uh, awful thing coming, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, I do think the dollar, surprisingly, this this recent move, you know, gold's had a nice move, silver's had a nice move of late. It's really come while the dollar's been, you know, moving up. So the dollar had its nice move down. And then for the last um, couple of months, I guess, has, has had this, you know, strength again. Um, I think it kind of coincided with the move up in rates. I think both of those are running their course as we speak. You know, they're very close to where I think they roll over again. And I have a very aggressive downside target on the dollar, not necessarily coinciding exactly with either the equity melt up or the precious metal move here. Uh, I think it probably takes longer. It'll move maybe somewhat into the early stages of the bust, but I have a downside target of 82 on the dollar. Um, and you know, from we're 104 now, from 104 to 82 is a, a heck of a drop. If it does half of that, that's a big drop. So surprisingly, we've had this metal move, this early metal move without the dollar, without the benefit of the weak dollar. I think the weak dollar is going to help drive the rest of it. Um, so that's part of it. You know, I have a, a very bullish call on bonds. So rates I expect to come down. Uh, I think that, in, you know, in the next four or five months, that too, I think is going to help uh, the metals. So maybe there's something else out there. Um, you know, I I just don't have an ability to see it. Remain, remains to be seen. Do you think eventually the, um, the the fiscal situation in the United States, the massive amount of debt that we have, uh, obviously, I think the, the interest expense now on the debt alone is almost a trillion dollars per year. And, and no one seems to have any will to, to, you know, political will to talk about addressing this national debt. If it continues to expand uh, and we also at some point get into a little bit higher interest rate environment, does that start to play in to the uh, to the gold and silver price? If you're looking to buy gold, silver or platinum, do yourself a favor and check out Pimbex, the online precious metals bullion dealer and sponsor of Ron's Basement. I was a happy customer before they offered to support the channel. You'll find they have the best prices, quality, and service. I think Pembex is best, and you will too. And be sure to tell them that you're from Ron's Basement. Well, I think, you know, I've had for a long time, people think I'm a broken record, but I, I tend to look out a distance. Mm -hmm. So I have had for a long time this idea that this cycle ends in a melt-up, meaning the stock market, you know, ends in a parabolic run uh, and i think we've entered that even though we're correcting this week and i called that i thought we probably would pull back this week but i think between now and the end of the year we're going to go parabolic in the equity market so i i have a forecast of that you know with I, and by the way i've raised my s p target to 7500 so i was already crazy at 7000 but you know i've i've increased that um but so after the melt up i have the call for next year of a global bust which I define as something um, bigger than a recession, um, but uh, kind of in the time frame of recession. So it's not quite a depression. It's not drawn out over a decade or anything like that. It's probably contained in the time of recession, 12 to 18 months. But it comes with, similar to 2008, 9, except I think worse, comes with a, a financial crisis of, of um, major size, um, very historic. So, so that's what I see for next year. The, the response to that, what I think is probably the most predictable thing I can come up with, you know, of all my forecasts, it's the easiest thing to predict, yeah. is that at some point, the central banks are gonna have to respond in a way they've never responded, you know, um, bigger than 
2008-9, uh, bigger than 2020, which was, you know, five trillion coming out of the Fed. I am on record as saying I would not be surprised to see 20 trillion coming out of the Fed this time in QE or, you know, balance sheet expansion and the, all the other central banks doing proportionally something similar. Yeah, that's unheard of. I mean, it's way beyond precedent, way beyond anything we've ever seen. That's where I get the numbers beyond the bust for precious metals. It's, you know, I'm, I'm calling for a, you know, a big inflation cycle post bust, deflation in the bust next year, mm -hmm. and then post bust, uh, ultimately leading to inflation of maybe as high as 25% in this country by early next decade. It's in that, with all that money sloshing around or put put into the system, you uh, and you get that kind of inflation cycle. I think you will see gold to twenty thousand, silver to maybe five hundred, uh, and obviously those are just rough guesses as to where we can go in that kind of an environment. So, so I don't need a lot of other things to point in the direction of you know precious metals having a cycle like they've never had. Um, I'm forecasting $500 oil in that cycle. So again, it's going to be a su commodity super cycle. The thing that will, I think, probably lead the performance parade will be gold and silver and obviously the miners um, with energy not far behind with, you know, the base metals like copper and, and iron ore and things not far behind that. So, um, you know, there's going to be, I think, a very different cycle from the last 40 years where consumer has been kind of the king. I think commodities are going to be the king. Yeah. I think it's going to be a new, a new environment uh, that most Americans, unfortunately may not be prepared for when you're, when, when we talk about the bust next year, the potential bust and the feds reaction, is it, is it safe to say that, you know, if we look back just in recent history, like when the tech bubble burst, when we had the great financial crisis, and then when we had the um, the, the health, you know, C-19 crisis in 2020, that, that what we have observed from the Fed is that they're, the, the only medicine they've had or the choice they've made was to uh, kind of stick Band-Aids over things. And they did that by ever increasing amounts of uh, stimulus or money printing that we've now gotten to this point where when I look at the U.S. debt clock, we have $35.7 trillion in debt. We talked about the interest expense. Have we, have we reached a point where um, the, 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 the numbers have gotten so big <laughs> and that the system is actually in some ways more delicate than it maybe would have been 20 or 30 years ago. We're also dealing with a new world kind of geopolitical order that um, that that really, as we hit the bust in 2025, the, the, the Fed will be faced with two options, either let everything implode, which they won't do, or, you know, give it even more gas, which is what, is that what, what you're saying when you're saying the potential for $20 trillion of, of yeah. Fortuna mining is a global intermediate gold and silver producer. Since 2005, Fortuna's best in class management has delivered impressive growth and profits. Fortuna's solid financial position and operational expertise allows for performance in any precious metals price cycle but also provides a foundation from which to harvest robust profits in more favorable metals markets. Investing in Fortuna is an investment in quality, long-term, sustainable production of in-demand precious and base metals. Yeah, absolutely. I think the reality is, and that's why I say it's the easiest prediction I can make, Yeah, is if you're, if you're handed, you know, if your policymakers are handed the choice between saying, well, theoretically, we don't want to repeat what we did before. You know, we're being criticized for all that money we created. And, of course, Paul's been out there saying, I'm not going to repeat that. You know, we're not going yeah. to do QE again. That's, sure. easy to, that's easy to say. And that's why I know he has no idea what's coming. When, when you're faced with something like I'm describing, mm -hmm. they're not going to be sitting there theorizing. They're going to be saying, we got to save the system. The yeah. only thing we have as a tool that can move quickly enough to save a system is money. You know, you can't go to Congress and say, can you guys deliberate on this and come up with an answer for us? You mm -hmm. can't, you know, you can't think, okay, if we, you know, provide some help for, uh, you know, the 
the consumers and the households out there, we can save the banks. That's not going to do it. You know, this stuff happens fast. You know, when you're in when you're in markets and when you're in the financial system, it doesn't happen over years. It happens in a split second. You know, all of a sudden mm -hmm. you got banks. Well, just go. And the thing is, people don't have to go way back to 29 to figure this out. I mean, you can look at 2008, nine and have an idea of how fast it goes from, Hey, everything looks okay. to Oh my God. And that's, I think only yeah. speed it up when you've got, you know, I remind people our, our federal reserves balance sheet in October of, of 2008 was 875 billion. It got up to mm -hmm. 9 trillion last year and they've been trying to bring that down some so it's down to maybe seven i don't know where it is exactly seven and a half um and so we're way beyond anything and that 875 billion was the highest level it had been since its creation in 20 in 1913 so we you know yes we've we've gone you know off the rails we've gone things have gotten a lot more volatile and a lot bigger than they were and that's I call it a super cycle when you're, you know, the big long cycle between two depressions, mm -hmm. the 1930s being the last depression, and I think the 2030s being the next depression. So next year is going to feel like a depression, but it's not the depression because they have the wherewithal to print their way out of it one more time. Yeah. But, but I believe in that super cycle, if you look at history and look at, you know, since basically 1940 each successive cycle has gotten more dramatic and more you know more uh extreme and each each cycle or at least most of them have required more medicine to pull us out of it and then created more of the extreme in the other direction so you you get this kind of sense where it's just uh, you know, i don't know what it is i'm not a mathematician but sine waves or whatever it is where you get right. this kind of you know, yeah. thing where it's getting, and I think we're at that that point where we're one cycle away from the end. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, as I say, the difference between, say, me and a Peter Schiff or a lot of the Austrians who are kind of predicting the gloom and doom now, saying this is it. You know, we've we've cooked our goose and it's done. The difference between them and me is that I I see the wherewithal because we'll be, if not in um uh deflation next year pretty close mm -hmm. that means the central banks have infinite ability to print money yeah because of leads and lags they won't see inflation with all that money for a year or two or three mm -hmm. probably probably a year or two um so while you're in the period where it's a deflationary global bust they're not going to be sitting there saying well if we do this it's going to create inflation they're going to say what do we have to do to save the system so because they have the printing press one more time, I can I can sit here with pretty be pretty confident that we can save the system one more time. The, they'll be slow, and that's why you get a bust. If if mm -hmm. they saw what I see, they could react now, and it could be a smoothed out. You know, it'd be, still be a bad recession, but not a bust. And I'm not just saying our Fed. I mean all central banks, ECB for sure. And, Etc. If they react now, we might not have that. But they're not going to react now because their mindset is still looking back at 2008, 9 and everything since, and all the criticism they got in the decade, the last decade, and they're saying we're not going to do that again. We know we made a mistake. We gotta, we gotta be more careful about um, easing. We gotta be more cognizant of the fact that with leads and lags, you can get inflation. So their mindset is fighting the last war. They have no idea that they've already sown the seeds for a disaster here. And, yeah. and and they give lip service to leads and lags, but the Fed really doesn't understand. They've already over tightened. Yeah. And and you know, it's not just Jay Powell, it's basically most everybody on Wall Street is telling them, you know, uh, look at all the discussion since the Fed cut 50 base points. Mm -hmm. Well, was that a mistake? Maybe they got too aggressive on cutting. And, and I'm sitting here going, they should have cut in July. Maybe they should have cut before that. The leads and lags, you know, you won't know that they're, they've stayed the party too long on the tight side until sometime next year, you know? So they're sitting here doing their darn best to kind of look at things 
today and judge what's going to be tomorrow and what policy should be today. But they're really using backward looking data. Uh, they're really, even though they know there are leads and lags, they don't know how how long those leads and lags are and how things can seemingly be okay and then abruptly change. Um, so there's all of that that plays into this. And, and you know, I, I get somewhat protective of Powell, even though I was very critical of him earlier on and go, it's, it's really not that he's doing such a bad job based on what you see today, you would say he did a good job. It's, it's the nature of the beast. Yeah. So, so, so as we go into the bust, hypothetically or possibly in 2025 um, we'll see interest rates come down I would imagine and because people will be running to bonds and then uh, like you said right the Fed still has one more you know one more trick up their sleeve one more big bazooka to kind of reignite the economy <laughs> um, at some point does this result in uh, obviously the national debt's going to continue to spy at some point to do 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 we run out of buyers for our national debt? And does that mean that the Fed then becomes, you know, that they monetize the debt, that they start to actually, you know, print money to, to kind of subsidize the U.S. government, which to me could precipitate the, uh, uh, the, the, the kind of the final, I don't know how the word is, dilution or devaluing of the U.S. dollar. Is that what leads us into the, the ultimate uh, bust? If, in the end? If, yeah, it plays out that way. What, what really happens is, OK, let's say and again, I'm not going to be spot on on this mm -hmm. is just sure. Generally, but let's say between, you know, second quarter of next year and maybe even before, maybe it starts in the first quarter of next year. And and sometime in 2026, they put out 20 trillion dollars. Now, it's going to mm -hmm. start slow there. You know, again, their mindset is we don't want to do this. So they're going to be reluctant. Right to do it it's only going to be when they're forced to do it because the banks are failing around the world mm -hmm. and you know they only have one tool then they'll start gearing up but initially they might start you know with a trillion dollars and say we're doing a lot i don't know if we should do this but ultimately they'll get to 20 over the course of many many months um it's think about what what qe is think of what that 20, 20 trillion is that's the Fed buying every bond they can find, right? Okay, right. And so they'll be monetizing the debt next year to mm -hmm. the tune of a, a level we've never seen before. And you say, well, where are they going to find 20 trillion bonds? Well, guess what? The government's mm -hmm. going to be print, the government's going to be issuing debt right alongside that monetizing of the debt. So there's going to be plenty of new debt that will be monetized. There won't be, the reason I can predict a 0% tenure at the bottom of the bust you know, whether it's late next year or whatever, um, is because I'm not worried about whether Japan's going to be selling bonds or buying bonds. I'm not worried about whether China's going to be getting rid of the rest of their treasuries. I'm not worried about whether Europe's going to be buying our bonds or whoever, whether the you know insurance companies are going to be buying our bonds. The Fed's going to be buying every bond they can to mon get money into the system. So mm -hmm. for next year, at least, you've got a buyer that's going to be insatiable and uh, have an insatiable appetite so so that's why rates will go will plummet you know they'll they'll head down here i think we're close to the end on this correction in rates they'll they'll head down here i think you might even see two and a half by early next year um you know certainly three percent and maybe two and a half and then maybe you get a little correction or something who knows but ultimately the big move from two and a half three uh, might even if it backs up a little in a correction be above that down to zero most of that move will be coming during the monetization you know during the fed printing money like crazy and this is going to happen in canada australia europe japan china's already starting to do it um so um but the the real story which you you were really alluding to is once once we get through the bust and we have a recovery the first year out of the out of a, a bust because you're coming out of deflation, that first year will be pretty low inflation. If not, you know, it'll be not nil, but it'll be low, low single digit probably. Second year might might move up to high single digits. By the third year, you're into double digits, and you know, five six years out, you're into the fifteen to twenty percent range on the way to twenty five. The first year or two, 
the Fed, you know, if you're if you if you're issuing that much more debt, you're going to have that much more interest expense, even if rates have fallen. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the first year or two, this the government's going to think, okay, we can do MMT. You know, we'll just hold right. more bonds to pay more interest. You know. Yeah, look, um, this it worked. It worked. Yeah, it worked. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then, but by the time rates start ramping up, and I think ramping up, we've already seen it doesn't take much above five percent to get right. you in trouble. Mm-hmm. Once you get five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, on the way to fifteen, and on the way to twenty, and that's for debt, that's for treasury interest rates. We'll be bankrupt. I mean, we won't yeah. be able to, you know, because because what happens once you get above a certain level, and I think that level isn't much above 5%, but certainly above 7 or 8 once you get there, any more money you print, monetizing that debt, it very quickly turns into more inflation and more and higher interest rates, so that you, you very soon run into the situation where we just sold more debt, we just floated more debt to pay more interest, but but that's already been eaten up by the rise in interest rates, by the rise in inflation. <laughs> yeah. So it's as I say, it's like it's like having a, a fire hose out in the California forest fires with gasoline pouring out of that that hose. You know, it just ignites a much bigger fire. It's doing you no good. It's making it worse. And so I think whether it's twenty twenty seven or eight somewhere out there, I think you really shut down the Fed. And you Mm -hmm. certainly shut it down when you get even later than that in the decade where they are no longer able to print money. That will be the first time, well, we've had temporary periods of that, like recently, you know, when inflation got up over five towards nine. Uh, We had it back in the early 80s. But very rarely have we had a situation where the Fed says we can't come to the rescue. That will be the situation late this decade where Mm -hmm. we'll be faced with an economy that's really troubled by very high inflation and consumer in trouble, um, a, a government that doesn't have the ability to float debt because the capital market's saying, who wants that? You know, right. I, I've done the, I've done the um, workup on, on your debt. You can't pay your interest, never mind service the debt. Um, so we're not, we're no longer interested in that. And your buyer of last resorts are out of the business because it just inflates the economy, inflates to cause more inflation. Once you get there, the game's over. We've we've been able to play this game for probably the last 40 years, uh, certainly last 30, uh, to make it look like we're still a growing economy, make it look like our standard of living hasn't been sinking, but it has. And what's been and and more lately in the last recent years, our government's expanding, our private sector's you know, in the in the dumps, except for you know exceptional industries like AI and tech, et cetera. But but basically, that game's going to be very clearly over, and our standard of living is going to then you know reach reality. Um, and I think when you get to and I say the twenty thirties, but I don't mean twenty thirty or twenty thirty one. I would guess more towards twenty thirty three to thirty five. I think you have a collapse of the global system because mm-hmm. this will be repeated around the world. It's not just the U.S. that's done this. So basically all the world is going to be, you know, you can't have 320 trillion in debt out there. Right. Yes, I realize a lot of it's sovereign debt, but I just explained why sovereign debt's not going to be worth a damn. Um, you can't have 320 trillion debt. And once we get through the bus, probably have 450 to 500 trillion in debt. Yeah. And, and come up with an, uh, an equation when inflation's high double digit that can be solved. It, yeah. it just collapses onto itself. And I, that's the difference between next year, which will be, in my opinion, the biggest downturn and certainly the biggest financial crisis in the post-World War II era, but it's so bigger in 2008, nine. Uh, but the difference between that and a total collapse in the 20, th- mid 2030s where basically I describe it as, and I don't say this to be, um, to exaggerate it or scare people, but right. it's just what I think is likely coming is that you can, as a scenario, not a forecast, but you could have an economy in the dumps where unemployment's 50% or higher. Um, 
no welfare system to speak of, no unemployment to speak of, Social Security and Medicare, if not totally done, you know, you're getting very small partial payments. Um, and a government that's just is nowhere to be seen to be able to help you. So it's going to be all out there, everybody fighting for themselves. You know, I, I can't I can't yeah. even pretend to know what kind of awful situation we'll be facing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and, and I think it's important to recognize that what you're talking about is rooted in mathematics. And I love the saying mathematics shows no forgiveness on the altar of truth. Right. Like this is just kind of the facts of what what is going on. I used to use this analogy. Um, you know, you talked about the game, you know, and it does. It kind of feels like a game that's been played by the Fed and I guess to our by our government to a certain extent to, to kind of perpetuate the system. That it's kind of like a fun house, you know, at a kid at a, at a at a kid's fun fair. You go inside the fun house and they got a smoke machine and mirrors and everybody's having fun. But at some point they flip the lights on, right? And you know, the fun's over, the you know, the distorted mirrors and this and that, that reality eventually sets in uh for, for the world. And it's I, I think it's it, we're talking about the whole world at this point. First Mining Gold is a development company advancing two of the largest gold projects in Canada, Springpole in Ontario and Duparquet located in Quebec. Each already has 5 million ounces of gold reserves, but exploration initiatives are underway at both projects to find even more gold. First Mining is well financed, has zero debt, and owns an interest in four additional Canadian gold development projects. Yep. And I, I will say it, it it's because obviously with social media, it's it's one of the main themes out there. Everybody wants to point the figure finger at you know Jay Powell or right. uh, uh, Christine Lagarde or um, you know our policymakers in general Congress, and they all deserve some blame. They all deserve, yeah. you know, they didn't do this well. But in reality, I don't think, and, and of course the other theme that's out there is that this is all deliberate and they're trying to bring us down. And right. they, there's some truth in that, but not so much here. In in terms of the financials, I think this is just, they're they're too myopic in what they see. Their, their understanding of things goes so far. I, you know, I feel blessed that I have, whether it's my brain type or whether it's 50 years of doing this or the combination of both or whether I just, you know, whether it's my education background, whatever it is, I have a wherewithal to see a bigger picture than a lot of these policymakers are obviously able to see. I, they're not trying to, they, they have no idea what we just described is coming. Right. They, I mean, they, they think they are doing their job to try to avoid those kind of things. Um, you know, 2008, nine was a, a real wake up call, but I think they think that now they're more on, on guard for things like that. And they think they can avoid it. Yeah, I, you know, again, this is where I think 50 years of doing this and, and right. paying attention to the cycles all through that time does come in handy as I do know how fast this stuff can come on you and not be seen. And so, um, so what I would say is I almost think you know, the Kondratiev wave or, you know, other big waves out there or, um, you know, what's the the book out there right now talking more demographically uh, that the big turning or whatever it is. Uh, um, you know, those things, I think, fit in. In other words, this is almost inevitable. It's human nature. Yeah. It's, it's you know, you, you got so far away from the Great Depression, you don't know what got us into the Great Depression. You know? <laughs> right. And you, you even though 2008 9 is fresh in our minds, I think they don't realize, as I explained before, yeah. they are fighting that war. That's part of why we're going to have this, is because yeah. they're, you know, they're trying so hard not to do uh, what happened in 2008 9 that they're going to be slow to react. And it's that slowness in reacting that leads to a much deeper problem. You know, mm -hmm. just like I, I look at the current makeup of the FOMC and their approach to things, and it's been basically a Fed approach all along, but is you know, you have a committee and they're trying so hard not to repeat mistakes of the past. And they're they're trying to do it by micromanaging and you know looking at data right up to the minute and you know just before the meeting and trying to you know not not make mistakes. 
and yet so much of this stuff requires much longer vision mm -hmm. you don't have it you know it's just not their approach um so and and by by saying we don't want to, and again, they've been encouraged by, by Wall Street to say we don't want to um, reignite inflation. So we're going to be very cautious in, in dropping rates. It's that very policy that's going to put you behind the ball and cause you to then have to gear up very, very aggressively. So mm -hmm. the very thing you're trying to avoid is actually what you're going to cause. And again, yeah. they're not doing it on purpose. It just it's it's how this stuff works. Yeah, it's it's fascinating. Sometimes it feels like they're they're trying to repair the car uh, as it's driving down the highway, right? Like we got to deal with these issues as they're popping up, and I think it becomes um, a, a very tricky situation the further down the road we go. And you know, you talked about the the, the 08 great financial crisis. Do you think that part of the problem also is that they can look back at that and say, well? Sure, it was horrible, and we were, you know, on the on the precipice of some really bad things happening. But, but look, we were able to fix it. We, you know, in my opinion, they kind of papered over everything. There weren't many consequences, um, and so now they think, well, we can deal with anything. Well, we dealt with, you know, the uh, the the, uh, the pandemic, and by printing, you know, like we can just this works, so we can continue to do that same thing. And but eventually, there are consequences. Eventually. You know, they're, they're, the 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 hens do come home to roost, for for lack of a better way to describe it. Yeah, I, I actually think it's the opposite. I think they mm -hmm. really strongly believe we got to do things to make sure we don't go back there. In other words, yeah, that was horrific, and we you know we pulled ourselves back from the cliff when the commercial paper market dried up and GE was rumored to go under, and you know all of that. Right. We we dodged a bullet there. We don't want to take that chance again. So they think they're doing the things to avoid that. And same thing, they, you know, Powell will tell you, you know, five trillion coming out of the Fed in, in the pandemic. Um, we don't want to repeat that. You know, we're, he's really saying, I don't want to do QE again. You know, I, I, we're going to be very cautious about how we draw down the balance sheet, but we want to draw it down. And I don't know where they're ultimately think they're going to take it, but they're not, they're not going to be able to do that. But I think it really is coming from good intentions to avoid what we had. I don't think they really are saying, oh, we can do that again. Uh, I think quite the opposite. But it, it you know, again, uh, and I see this, I, I see this, it's kind of parallel and, and funny, but I see this from a lot of retail people on Twitter. Everybody, uh, in, from an investment standpoint, everybody wants to compare you know, the current market to some other market, you know, right. looking back to 2008, or 29, or, and, and I hate overlays. I go, oh, those overlays never work. You know, right. somebody will show you a perfect setup where it's tracking just like 29 or it's tracking just like 2008, nine or whatever. And I go, those are made to fool you. I mean, you know, they're going to, they're going to take you there and then all of a sudden deviate completely. Um, you know, history rhymes, but it doesn't repeat like that. Mm -hmm. And I think it's similar, I think, for the policymakers, where the only thing they've got is history, and they're looking at history, but they're not really understanding that. Yeah, it's going to rhyme, but there's going to be some curveball that you guys are not prepared for. You know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And in this case, what what they are not prepared for is. Um, Debt that's so far above where it was in 2008-9, it was off the rails then, you know. But 320 trillion global debt and derivatives that are way beyond what we had in 2008-9 to the tune of quadrillions in notional value. So, so I mean, that's leverage is what jerks you around. Leverage is what takes you from things seemingly orderly to all of a sudden, oh my God, you know. Right. And that's I think that's. If, if there's one defining thing um, that's going to cause the bust, it's, it's this massive leverage that nobody has a handle on. Nobody could have a handle on. It's just so big. Mm -hmm. the, the derivatives market? Derivatives and debt. And, and the derivatives, debt. Obviously, for, derivatives are the leverage on the markets, and debt's mm -hmm. the leverage on the system. And I just think they're both so beyond anything we can manage. And you're right. I mean, derivatives more than... The debt, we kind of can look at that in a big picture, 
derivatives, there's nobody in the world that I think can really capture what, is, what does this mean? <laughs> Other than right. when it goes wrong, it's going to really go wrong. Is it is it is it accurate to say that the derivatives for the for the benefit of me and for the viewers as well that they're almost like bets on other bets that have been made in the in the market that they're that they're bets sure. on okay is that and and that we don't we don't really know how much is out there um, and like you said the the actual world debt level is enough to begin with but then you add on these quadrillions of derivative bets that that like they could explode potentially really quickly if things start to become a little bit unraveled. Yeah, I think I I just think leverage, you know, we went to school, Paul, yeah. I'm sure you got something in your classes like this, but leverage leverage works both ways. On the yeah. way up, it enhances things. On the way right. down, it really speeds up and magnifies your problem. Let me, let me let me interject something. And I've also learned that in real life as well. So yeah. go go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's true. And many people do every cycle, you know, mm -hmm. um, and it, it's funny. And again, you know, going back to saying, we, you know, we've, we've been, we've skipped generations or many generations past the Great Depression. So there's really nobody, not very many people around that caution you from the mistakes we're making again. But it's the same thing cycle to cycle. People, yeah. people repeat these mistakes, you know, you, you see, um, you know, they may do it a little differently, or they may think they are guarding against, um, you know, real estate problems and stuff. But we we get into these extreme places where, you know, you feel like home prices are moving away from you. You better buy now, even though you know that you might be buying at a top. I don't. I hear that a lot, but I don't think people who are first time buyers, let's say, or you know, yeah. afraid to miss out, I don't think they really realize what what it means to say you bought at the top and then to have a cycle come out from under you. I mean, mm -hmm. it really, it, it, I mean, it's bankrupted many, a uh, um, yeah. uh, you know, a contractor and, you know, many a home builder, et cetera. And it bankrupts many a home buyer that buys at the wrong time. So um, it just, you know, I, I just think people have short memories. Yeah. Yeah. Or yeah. no or, memories. <laughs> or no, or no memory. Right. If you buy a house for, six hundred thousand dollars with a with a full mortgage and two years later it's worth two hundred and fifty thousand dollars you're in a you're in a pretty bad spot yeah um and, and i'm not sure we're going to see that but even if it even if it drops 30 or 40 percent mm -hmm. if you if you if you really extended yourself to get this house because you're afraid if i don't buy now it's going to be worth 700 i can't afford that right uh, you know if it goes from 600 to say 400 you're a hurting dude. <laughs> yeah, right, 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 exactly. So I want to make sure I have this right, and, and you correct me here if I'm wrong. But what you're seeing here in the in the coming, let's say, months is a continued melt up in the general stock markets, um, and up to and including the silver and gold price. As we go into 2025, you can see the, a bust occurring, some some difficult times. Um, where do you see gold and silver? Uh, how, how do you see them performing throughout, let's say, 2025 and 2026? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, first, let me back up and just say, I think um, the likelihood is that the equity market tops out before the gold and silver. Mm -hmm. uh, part of that's just, you know, particularly silver is coming from so far back. I think they have more room to run. Um, so, but it's, it's a matter of months, you know. So let's say the market tops out December, January, um, you know, silver and gold might top out March, April, you know, something okay. like that. And I, again, I'm people say you keep extending your dates. I'm not giving you dates. I'm just giving you possibilities of what, right. you know, what a scenario might look like. So I, I do think they'll probably carry beyond people go. So the market's going to be heading straight down and gold and silver are going to be going, still going up. I go, you know, tops don't, you don't hit a top on it one day and go down the next, you know, and straight down, you know, there's going to be a process. So, you might actually hit the numerical peak in the stock market in December, um, but then not really, you know, then be within five or ten percent of that top for the next three or four months. You know, it doesn't mean it straight down. Um, so, and there's lots of scenarios you could paint. So I don't know, sure. but I'm just the odds are I think um, precious metals are late cycle things, so they're probably going to be the last things to roll over. Um, once you roll over. I'm guessing that silver obviously is the more volatile of the metals. 
I'm calling for an 80% bear market. And I don't know whether it's 70 or 80, you know, 85 or 65, but 80% is generally where I think we are going on the equity indexes uh, across the board, NASDAQ, S&P, uh, Russell, um, and um, Dow. So if you got an 80% bear market in stocks, Silver's probably going to get hit pretty darn high. I think everything's going to get hit in the bust, except for, say, treasuries. Um, silver could, uh, you know, let's say it goes to 75. It could come back here. It could come back to 20. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it wouldn't surprise me to have silver be, you know, down 50, 60, 70 percent. Mm -hmm. um, that's still less than the equity market, maybe. And maybe it'll do that much. But gold, on the other hand, is not going to be that kind of a decline but if gold goes if i'm right about 3400 on the upside you know wouldn't surprise me to see gold back to um you know somewhere close to where it broke out at 2100 so yeah. you know somewhere in the low 2000s um so much less you know half of what the equity market's doing but still a good hit mm -hmm. uh, so i tell people if you're if you're, you know, you're looking at gold and silver today, they're early on in big moves, but just understand, you know, you have to make your own decisions, but just understand sure. you can't, don't, don't think it's a buy and hold and you're going to be comfortable through that hold because as I say, it's like, I probably said this to you last time, but it's like standing on the South Rim of the Grand Canyon and looking across to the North Rim and thinking you can walk straight across and not yeah. understanding this massive canyon in between. Well, it's, the markets are going to be like that too during the bust. It's mm -hmm. yes, yes, it's, it's a great run from here to say 2031. You know, gold goes from, you know, 27 or 800 here and goes to 20,000. You can say, well, I, I'm not worried about the bust. I'm just buying now because look at that. But if you buy now and then you go down to, you know, 2100, after it runs to 3,400, I'm not sure you're going to be comfortable there. You know, knowing, right. knowing how psychology works on investors, you may say, uh, you may say at 3,400, I'm not worried if it drops by a third, but wait till <laughs> it drops by a third. You may say, well, I don't know if it's going to drop by half. I got to get out now. Yeah. So, so it's, you know, buy and hold is for those that really know themselves. Mm -hmm. um, for others, just know there's, there's going to be a, I think, there's an opportunity now and there's going to be another great opportunity on the other side of the bust. Yeah. Yeah. And then as we work through that bust kind of 2025, 2026 and the fed starts to, to react with the only thing they can do, which is going to be to, to essentially print money. Uh, then you see the metals starting to pick up from that point again, heading towards some of those targets that you're looking at for around, around the 2030 range. Yeah, I think, yeah. you know, it'll it'll come in spurts and it'll come, you know, sure. What what markets do, and that's why I have been so right about the melt up, is when you get towards the end of a cycle now, I think this stock cycle is coming to uh, an end of a 42 year secular bull market, which means going forward, the whole balance of the decade, they're not getting back to those highs. Mm -hmm. So the highs we reach in this run, whether it's 7,500 on the SP or, you know, 55,000 on the Dow or, 25,000 on the NASDAQ, those highs probably will not be seen again in a couple decades at least. And I, I say a couple of decades because I don't want to go out beyond that. But if we get a collapse in the system, they're not going to be seen again, period, at least right. for, for a long time. Um, so, so you'll be in a secular bear market, but that means you can have cyclical bulls within a secular bear for the equity markets, you know, 26 to 30, 31, whatever. Um, and then particularly the first year or two out of the bus, there'll be so much money sloshing around. You'll have a, you know, the stock market could triple or quadruple and still not get back anywhere near the highs. Yeah. Um, so you'll have an equity market for a couple of years. Precious metals, you know, the highs we reached before the bust are nowhere near the secular high. The secular high in, in the precious metals comes at, you know, early next decade is my guess. So, so, um, you know, it's a whole different cycle than the stock market. And, mm -hmm. but what I started to say is, you know, the melt up that I'm, the so called melt up that I've called for the equity market is because I saw it as the end of this long cycle. You'll have a similar thing in the metals 
late this decade. You know, as you draw closer to the end of the cycle, the moves are going to be steeper. There'll be, mm-hmm. uh, there'll be, you know, it'll be sawtooth. It'll be a stair step. But each cycle, just like 2020, 21 was a big cycle. This, this move from 2022 to the end, you know, the end that I think is coming in a few months is going to be steeper than that. So each cycle, as you move through the cycles, it tends to get steeper and steeper into the end. And then it finally goes parabolic. So, you know, the move in gold and silver after the bust, it'll, it'll move nicely early on, but then it'll just keep, uh, you know, the, the slope right. will get steeper as you get into the late, the later part of it. Yeah. Thank you. David, thank you for coming on today. Um, I know my audience gets a lot from, from hearing from you. I learn a lot from hearing from you. And I was thinking, uh, I last had you on five months ago. It was May of 2024. And uh, you don't give, you know, absolute, you know, specific predictions, but, but a lot of the things you talked about, actually, most all of them five months ago, uh, kind of occurred uh, over the last five months. And now as I'm thinking five months from now, which would put us into early 2025, uh, next time we talk, <laughs> uh, I'm wondering where we, what, what we might be facing at that point. It'll be very interesting uh, because I agree with you and, uh, and what you say makes sense. That's why I've, I've followed you closely over the last, gosh, three or four years. I know you're very active on Twitter is that how you recommend that people kind of stay in touch with you and follow you? Yeah, I don't have a website. So Twitter's where I hang out and I'm on there pretty much every day. Um, my handle is at Dave H contrarian, not David H, not Dave H <laughs> contrarian spelled wrong. There are fake accounts that like to do those kind of things, but at Dave yeah. H contrarian, um, I do get people oftentimes saying, where have you been? I haven't seen you for months. And I go, I've been on here. I've probably had dozens of posts on here almost every day. You're mm-hmm. missing something. And what you're missing is you're waiting for me to do original posts, to initiate mm-hmm. a post. Most of the activity I have on, on Twitter, I occasionally I'll do an initiate of a post, but most of it is replying to others. So you have to check your settings on Twitter or on X and make sure you're set to see everything. And I'm not sure how you do that, but you know, you want to no- be notified for replies to be able to see all my activity. And I am on there pretty much all the time. So um, for better or worse. <laughs> right, right. Well, and I think also you can go to your, go to your, to go to your Twitter page as well, and then kind of see all your activity. Sure. Yeah. If somebody there. wants to just check in once in a while, they can go to my profile page and see all the tweets and all the replies um, that I've put up, you know, there's a whole history there from probably 2013, I think, is when I joined. And then I also do put out a quarterly investment letter um, that is not for everybody, but I've been writing it since I, when I was on the street as a sell side strategist. I started writing it in 20 in 2000, so I've been writing it for 24 years. Um, and in the last four or five years, I've started offering it to retail people. Most people that subscribe, pretty much anybody that subscribe say it's very readable for the retail investor. It's, you know, I, I'm pretty plain spoken, as you can tell. And, you know, I do use Wall Street slang sometimes. It might not be familiar to some, but generally it's very readable. And it's, you know, it's a lot of what you hear in my interviews, but, you know, it's a six or seven page quarterly letter where, you know, I have more ability to kind of fill out my thoughts and explain my rationale. Uh, so I have people that, Follow me closely on Twitter, but still keep resubscribing, saying, no, believe it or not, it's the same stuff, but I get so much more out of doing both. Okay. So um, so it's anyway, if people are interested in the letter, um, they can direct message me. It does. It is a subscription. So it's by you know subscription fee. It's, there's a cost. Mm-hmm. But if they want information on, on it, they just uh, direct message me on Twitter or on X. Uh, and I'll get right back to them with details. Okay. Sounds great, David. Thank you. And uh, I, I'm going to look forward to seeing you again in about another five months and we can kind of review what happened and see why it's hard to believe it'll be 2025, but uh, kind of see where, where you think we're heading uh, through the balance of 2025. Yeah, we've got, I mean, we've got an election two weeks away. We've yeah. got, you know, holidays and we've got what I, if, if I'm right about this forecast, I think the, the, 
time between now and the end of the first quarter is going to be something for the history books. Yeah. And we have the BRICS meeting going on, which starts today, you know, potential for geopolitical change. And we have uh, some wars going on in the world at the same time. It's uh, yeah, yeah. You don't want to dismiss those either. Yeah, no, <laughs> it's crazy times, and some of that may be. Again, it, it's funny how all of these things, even though markets seem you know aren't supposed to be tied in, or the economy aren't supposed to be tied in, all of these things seem to be all part of that same super cycle. You know. Yeah. We're we're in volatile times. Yeah. Yeah. It'll be interesting. Well, thank you again on behalf of myself and our viewer for the time you've given us, the knowledge you've given us, and we're going to look forward to seeing you next time. Yeah. Thanks, Ron. Hey, you have a good good, uh, end of the year. You too. Thanks, David. Thank you.